Good morning, friends. My name is Tony Miano. I am from Faith Community Church in Santa Clarita. I'm here with my friend Peter, who is also from Faith Community, and my friend Stephen, who is from Granada Hills Community Church. We all share a, a common bond in our faith in Jesus Christ, and the three of us are here this morning to bring to you the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word gospel, by definition, means good news. And while some of you may not like what you hear today, I can assure you that ultimately what we're bringing you today is good news. The very best news. Salvation from sin and eternal life with Jesus Christ the Lord. Now it's, it's very important, my friends, that you understand that there is but one true Christ. There are many different understandings, many different definitions as to who Jesus Christ is, but there is only one Christ. And that is the Christ, the God-man, who was with the Father in creation, for whom all things were created, by whom all things were created. Jesus Christ is God. Now most, if not all, of the major religions of the world will deny that to one extent or another. The Jehovah's Witnesses who are out in force this morning here believe that Jesus is the incarnation of Michael the Archangel. That is a lie. Uh, the Mormon faith believes that Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer. That is likewise a lie. The Muslims believe that Jesus was nothing more than a good prophet, second to Muhammad. That too is a lie. Jesus is second to no one. Jesus created Mohammed. Then there is the false Jesus of Oprah Winfrey who believes that Jesus is just one of many ways to heaven. That too is a lie. The truth is this, and it is what Jesus said. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And that is the Jesus we are here to represent to you today. The, the Jesus who has revealed himself in creation. The Jesus who has revealed himself and testified to himself in his word. And the Jesus who has written his law and his existence, the reality of both, on each and every human being's heart. That is the Jesus that we represent to you today. Fully God, fully man, God in the flesh, the only one who can forgive your sins, the only Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord. My friends and I were talking about this this morning. We read it in the news last night that a woman in Texas was sentenced to 99 years in prison for torturing her two-year-old daughter. Apparently, according to uh, news stories, news sources, she was having a hard time potty training her, her two-year-old little girl. So she beat that little girl until she fell into a coma, and then she glued the little girl's hands to a wall. So tightly fastened were her hands to the wall that, that when they removed her hands, the flesh from her palms was still on the wall. Now when you hear a story like that, a 99 year sentence should sound just. I mean who, who would torture a two year old little girl simply because they had a difficult time being potty trained? Who would torture a two year old little girl for any reason? And when we hear a story of someone doing something so depraved, so wicked, so evil, our hearts and our minds scream for justice. We scream for justice. What would you think of the judge if the jury had found her guilty and instead of a 99 year sentence, the judge let her off with time served for good behavior and encouraged her to have more children. What would you think about that judge? 
Would that be a good judge in your eyes? Would that be a righteous judge? Would that be a just judge? Or would that be a corrupt judge who should be removed from the bench? I think we would all agree, if we're being reasonable, if we're being honest, that any judge who would let a woman go free after she tortured her two-year-old daughter by beating her into a coma and then gluing her hands to the wall, I think we would scream for not only justice for that woman who victimized that helpless child, but for justice in removing that judge from the bench. And if you do think that way, if you're incensed by that kind of evil, it's because you have a conscience that is working. My friends, you need to understand that God is a judge. Now, unfortunately, many churches, many religions in the world today will not tell you that because they don't want to do anything or say anything to upset you. They want you to keep filling the seats every Sunday. They want you to keep filling the plates every Sunday. And so they will not tell you this kind of truth because they don't want you to go away. In the end, they're more concerned about what you will do for the church than your very soul. But my friends and I, whether you like it or not, whether you like us or not, we don't care. We're going to tell you the truth because that's what God commands of us, to speak the truth in love. And to speak only half a truth is to speak no truth at all. And it's certainly not loving to withhold truth from people who need to hear it. But my friends, even if you would deny it when I say these words, you know this is true because it's already written on your heart that God is, God exists, and God is a good judge. God is going to judge evil. God does judge evil. And in fact, many people would try to make the argument that God doesn't exist because there's evil in the world. They see God as slow to respond to the evil that takes place in the world today. But it is God's grace that keeps him from exercising the full measure of his justice and wrath against evil. We, we, want, we want murderers to be rid from the world. We want pedophiles to be rid from the world. We want rapists and, and, and child molesters and, and those who victimize children. We want them all to be rid from the world. We, we cry out, even if we say we don't believe in God, we cry out to God saying, God, why don't you rid the world of evil? But we don't consider this. If God, it is 8.30 now, if God were to re uh, rid the world of all evil at 8.30, where would we be at 8.31? Is, was that your IQ, sir? Was that, do you have an intelligent response or is that the best you can do? Come on, young man, come back and talk. Don't be afraid. Only, only cowards flee when no one pursues. Come on now, come on. Don't do the mock walk, come on back. My friends, where would we be if God rid the world of all evil at 831? Listen to what the Word of God says. Romans 1, beginning in verse 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's decree, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. God bless you, young man. You have a good day. Can you find yourself on that list? Have you not ever boasted about something? 
Have you not ever slandered another person by 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 talking dis disrespectfully about them or 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 lying or embellishing about something you perceive they did? Have you not ever invented evil? Have you never plotted in your mind to do something that you know you ought not do? Have you ever been foolish in the way you respond to the reality of who God is or in any other area of your life? Have you ever been heartless to another person, overlooked their need and just walked on by without doing anything? Have you ever been a hater of God? And my friends, the reality is, is if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, that's how God sees you. He doesn't see you as a child of God. He sees you as a child of wrath. Now look, everything I'm pointing out to you, I'm guilty of. I don't stand here pointing a finger at anybody because then there's three pointing back at me. I'm a sinner just like everybody else. But the reality is, my friends, if and when God does away with all evil in the world, he's not only going to do away with the woman who beats her two-year-old daughter into a coma and then glues her hands to the wall. He's not only going to rid the world of that person. He's not only going to rid the world uh, of the heinous pedophile who kidnapped that poor little girl in Colorado and murdered her and left her body in the park. He's not only going to do away with that kind of evil. He's not going to do away with only the kind of evil that leads a man to stalk a 12-year-old girl on the internet to the point of causing her to commit suicide. He is going to do away with all evil, my friends. And God sees lying as evil. God sees hatred as evil. God sees stealing as evil. God sees taking his name in vain as evil. God sees looking at another woman or man with lust as evil. God sees coveting as a form of idolatry. He sees coveting as not being content with what God has given us in this life. He sees that as evil. For God is perfect, God is holy, and all sin, no matter how small we've made it in our own mind, is infinitely sinful to an infinitely holy God. So if you cry out to God to rid the world of evil, you are asking him to heap his wrath upon your own head. Because all of us have sinned, all of us have fallen short, of the glory of God. And not only do we do the things that God hates, but we go as far as to applaud those who do them, to validate it. We do it with our vote. God hates abortion, but yet we'll vote for candidates who will kill unborn children. God hates all forms of sexual sin, but we will blaspheme him by, by changing the institution of marriage and making it something other than what God intended, one man with one woman, and we'll applaud those sexual deviants who would seek to blaspheme God by making marriage something it's not. Excuse me? I can't hear you. Do you want to talk about that or are you just going to walk on by? You do? Because what you just said didn't make sense. Well, originally marriage was actually a contract between two people and paying two families. Actually, no it wasn't. Yes, marriage was when one man came together with one woman to become one flesh for all eternity. But people like this young lady crossing the street will create a God in her own imagination to suit herself and say that marriage is nothing more than a contract. No, it's not more than a contract. It is something that God has created to bring himself glory through the procreation of a man and a woman as they, as they make children, as they have children. My friends, God is not only going to judge the sins that you don't like. He's going to judge the sins that you love because he's good.
My friends, each and every one of us are part of the ultimate statistic. 10 out of 10 people die. We're all going to die someday. It's not a scare tactic. It's simply a reality of the world that we live in. You may cheat death once or twice, but you will not cheat death forever. You get older every day, and one day you will die. And when you die, you're going to stand before God to give an account for your life. He's not going to judge you based on how you see yourself in the mirror. He's not going to judge you based on how you compare yourself to other people. He's not going to judge you by the religion you've chosen to practice. He's going to judge you by the standard of his law. Because God is the ultimate and perfect judge. If you've done any of the things that I've just mentioned or, or anything else that is contrary to the word or will of God in thought, word, or deed, God will find you guilty on that day. And because he is good, he must punish sin. And the punishment God has ascribed for sin is eternity in hell. It doesn't matter whether you like that. It doesn't matter whether or not you believe it. What matters is that it's true. If you were to stand before a judge in a courtroom having been found guilty of breaking the law, and you say to the judge, Your Honor, I believe you rented that robe. I don't believe you're the judge. I don't believe the jury found me guilty. I don't believe I broke the law. In fact, I believe I'm free to go because I'm a good person. How close to the courtroom door will you get before the judge has the bailiff tackle you and cart you off to jail? It didn't matter for a second what you thought about the judge of the law. What mattered is what the judge thought about you. And my friends, that same judge, that same God who is holy and righteous and just, who is angry with the wicked every day, who will punish sin, is the same God, because there is only one God, is the same God who is also loving and merciful and gracious and kind. Romans 3. Chapter 3, verses 21 to 26 tell us this. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Many people believe that God is just going to arbitrarily forgive people. But he can't do that and remain holy. He can't do that and remain just. He can't do that and remain the punisher of sin. So we have a dilemma. How can a God who is holy and righteous and just, and at the same time loving and merciful and kind, how can he at the same time exact punishment against sin, while at the same time forgiving that sin? It's the cross. That is where justice and mercy kissed. At the cross. The requirements of God's law demanded a perfect, bloody sacrifice to make atonement for the sins of men. And that sacrifice had to be perfectly human, with no sin, and perfectly God because only God could satisfy the wrath of God. And that's why he sent his son to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. 2,000 years ago, God the Father sent his son to earth in the person of Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man and without sin. Unlike you and me, my friends, Jesus Christ never once violated the law of God in thought, word, or deed. He could not because he was and he is the sinless Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. Unlike us, he lived a perfect, sinless life that we cannot live. In about 33 years of that earthly existence, he voluntarily went to the cross to make satisfaction for sin. 
not because he was sinful, for he was not. He took upon himself the punishment we rightly deserve for our sins against God. And then three days later, he forever defeated sin and death when he rose from the grave. And unlike every other false god created in the imaginations of men, Jesus Christ is alive today. And he will return at a time of the Father's choosing. God the Father literally made him God the Son who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that through him we might receive, we might become the righteousness of God. Another way of putting that is on that great and terrible day when Jesus shed his innocent blood on the cross, God the Father looked upon his precious and perfect and priceless Son as if he had lived our filthy, sin-stained lives. And in exchange for those who repent, who turn from their sin and receive Christ as their Lord and their Savior, he looks upon them as if they had lived his Son's perfect and precious and priceless life. So in the end, it's not on the basis of anything we do that God extends forgiveness to us. It's based entirely on God's mercy and the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. My friends, if you want to get to heaven on your own, apart from Jesus Christ, here's what you must do. No, he's not. That's a lie, young man. Come back and make your point. You're believing a lie, young man. Jesus is alive. He is not dead. You are dead. You are dead spiritually in your trespasses and sins. My friends, what God commands of you this day is that you repent. That means to turn away from your sin and by faith turn to God. And by faith and by faith alone, receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. My friends, your goodness will not save you because God does not see you as good. You have sinned against Him. Your religion will not save you, my friends. Going to church every Sunday, going to Mass every day of the week, going to synagogue on Saturday, going to the, the mosque on Friday, going to Kingdom Hall any other day of the week, none of those things will save you. None of them. If you go up the street to In-N-Out Burger and eat a double-double every day of the week, I can assure you, you will never become a hamburger. Ever. Salvation is by the grace of God alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. It's not by your good works. It's not by your religion. It's not by your own perceived goodness. It's by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And my friends, if you do not, please, yes, we have Bibles here, they are free. The blue ones are in Spanish, the brown ones are in English. Please take the Word of God, it is a free gift. Do not claim to be open-minded if you're afraid to open the book. That would be hypocrisy. But my friends, if you do not hear the Gospel of Jesus Christ as a message of love, there are three reasons why that's the case. You love your sin more than you love God. You love yourself more than you love God. And on some level, you actually believe you are God and blaspheme his name with the thought. Your only hope, my friends, is in Christ. It's not in the church. It's not in a religion. It's not in yourself. Your only hope is Jesus Christ. Turn to Christ and live. That is the good news of the gospel. Every religion, my friends, will tell you this. Believe a set of rules, do X, Y, and Z, be a good person, and maybe it'll work out for you in the end. And all the world religions do is make you more a slave to sin. God, through Jesus Christ, offers you life. The truth is that none of us can work our way into heaven. None of us can deserve God's grace. None of us can deserve His mercy or forgiveness. It is a gift from God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
So turn to Christ and live. Turn to Christ and live. Again, we have three Bibles. The blue ones are in Spanish. The brown ones are in English. We invite you to come up on your own and just take one, please. If you have any questions about what you've heard this morning, we would love to talk to you about it. We will not argue with you about the existence of God because you already know that God exists. We will not participate in your blasphemy of God by playing God's defense attorney in a mock courtroom that you set up to justify your sin before God. God has already written the reality of his existence on your heart. You already know that God exists, but you simply suppress that truth by your unrighteousness, by your love for sin. So no, we will not entertain your sin by arguing with you about what you already know, that God exists and you will one day stand before him. But if you have real questions about the condition of your soul, we would love to talk to you. We're not going to argue anyone into heaven. Salvation is a work of the Lord. We can't argue you into heaven. We can't browbeat you into believing. If you believe because we ask you to, you're still lost. Salvation is the work of the, of, of the Lord. Salvation is in Jesus Christ alone. Praying a prayer will not make you right with God. Walking down an aisle will not make you right with God. Writing a date in your Bible will not make you right with God. Being in youth group will not make you right with God. Going on mission trips will not make you right with God. Preaching the gospel on the streets will not make you right with God. Salvation is by the grace of God alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, through his finished work on the cross, and through his glorious resurrection. There is nothing you can do to save yourself. Nothing. As a deputy sheriff for 20 years, I had a few occasions when I had to perform CPR on a person who stopped breathing, whose heart stopped beating. Tell me, my friends, was there anything that clinically dead person can do to bring themselves back to life? Could they help me perform CPR? Could they encourage me to pump harder or breathe faster? No. The only way they were going to be brought to life is through outside intervention. And the only way you will be born again, the only way you will be brought to life spiritually is through the outside and miraculous intervention of Jesus Christ. It's only if he causes you to be born again that you will repent and put your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ alone. So cry out to God this day for his mercy. God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself before Almighty God, and on the last day he will exalt you and raise you up. Turn from your sin, and by faith and by faith alone, receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, while God has given you time. And thank you for listening.